So welcome everyone to our next lecture on machine learning. We continue with Gaussian processes. So last time we began already and maybe you already got confused with all the math and all the things. So today we will focus on the implementation and we will look at the code, how it's actually implemented. And this is like a, like a different description of the same stuff that you've seen in the math, but from the perspective of code. I also found another nice derivation, which is really short and which derives the main results basically from stuff that we had in our lecture on um, Gaussian distributions. Um, but before we start, um, let me um, just briefly show you here some online material on Gaussian processes as well. It will be in the slides. I think it's not yet in the slides. Um, so there are a couple of books out there. So in particular, the Carl Rasmus and Chris Williams book. So that's, I think, the best one. There are some other books that are on general machine learning or probabilistic machine learning that typically also have a chapter of, on GPs, like from David Mackay. And there's another one where I forgot the author, but I think I posted them at the beginning of the first lecture. Then there are a couple of researchers like David Duvineau. Here's a nice page on kernels. So if this link doesn't work anymore, there are then Google for his current web page, and there you find a cookbook for making kernel functions and what they, what, what, how do you choose them and all these different things. And that's interesting, not only for Bayesian people, but also for people who want to use them for support vector machines or other things. Then there's a nice animation, how one can visualize Gaussian processes with some wiggly curves going up and down. Maybe if you looked at the videos of the old lectures, you might have seen that already. And um, that's something that Philip invented and he has a paper where he explains how to do it. However, however, I found the explanation quite complicated. It requires some exponential and some tangent spaces and some, some tougher stuff. So during the lecture, we will develop like along the idea, something in my opinion, simpler to get similar looking simulations of GPs. Um, then there's a very nice interactive Gaussian process visualization we will also look at today. And then there are some block entries, which I had a look at and some one of them in particular is one from Peter Roland inspired me to explain the GPs yet another time, yet another way. And hopefully all these different perspectives you can bring together to get like a, a view on this. Then there's a nice article also from Yuge Shi. I think she's a um, PhD student in Oxford and um, she has a very nice description also on GPs with lots of material. There are also a couple of online lectures. And again, I'm promoting here the lectures of Philip Hennig. He's a former colleague of mine. So that's the stuff that I know. And so he's really an expert in this area. And he gave like a, a, a class with three lectures at the machine learning summer school in Tübingen in 2013. So those videos are available. If you want to have an updated version of those, you could also have a look at his lecture in Tübingen called probabilistic machine learning. And there in particular lectures nine to 11, they cover a lot of the material and, and he, he knows the stuff very well. So basically I took his slides and made new ones, but trying to understand and make sense out, out of his slides. So his work is the basis of my lecture here. Um, so let's get started with yet another view on GPs. And so why yet another view? So the, this other view might be even simpler than the stuff that we've seen before. So the stuff we've seen last time, I try to follow somewhat the reasoning in the book of Rasmussen and Williams. And here I'm try to follow a more straightforward approach. Okay, let me show you what I mean. So last time we had this gigantic definition of what a GP is, okay? And the essence of it is on the next slide, okay? So here's the essence. So GP is in a nutshell, a Gaussian process at finite locations um, is Gaussian, right? So more specifically, if we have a function f that is distributed according to a GP, then for any set of locations, um, the values will be jointly Gaussian distributed, okay? So a, a Gaussian process as being a stochastic process is somewhat an infinite object. And in order to say something about its properties, we collapse it into finitely many locations. And this is exactly the defining property of a GP that if I look at marginal distributions at finitely many locations, I get a Gaussian distribution. Where the mean vector now yeah, can be calculated using the mean function yeah, just by plugging in all these locations 
and the covariance matrix of this multivariate Gaussian distribution is just the kernel matrix, or in this context, it's also called the covariance matrix. So this function, the kernel function here, is also sometimes here called the covariance function. So this is basically GPs in a nutshell. And now in the following, we just use this property, right? We assume we have a GP prior, okay? Then we have finitely many training data, and we have finitely many observations, and we will look at this joint distribution and fiddle around with it. So the setup is as follows. Assume that the function f is sampled from a GP or distributed according to a GP with a certain mean function, a certain kernel function. Let's say we have some training data, which are locations x sub 1. So that's like a data set of location. And we have the corresponding values, which is basically applying this f to this S x1 plus some noise. Yeah, so the epsilon 1 is just now noise of the right shape and it gets added with some variance here uh, some 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 variance some some uh, maybe this should be just a sigma so maybe this is this is wrong so this squared should go away so we should put it into the rocket shed so if someone can put a note in the rocket shed that on slide 36 the square should go away way in front of the noise similarly we could also talk about test data right and that is also just yet another set of locations with some other values which we don't know and we want to do inference about those. But notice we have finitely many training points and we have finitely many test points. So in total we are looking at finitely many locations and we can use the insight from the previous slides that the joint distribution will be Gaussian. Okay. Um, for simplicity right now we look at the noise-free setup and I have more to say something about it in a couple of slides but let's first consider the simple case where we don't have at all noise. Now, being at finitely many locations, a joint Gaussian distribution can be written like this. So the vector of stacking the values of the training data and the unknown values of the test data, producing a long vector, given that I know all the location, is Gaussian distributed with this mean and this covariance matrix, where basically these different parts can be calculated from the kernel matrix, okay? And now this bigger kernel matrix has been split into the parts that correspond to the training data and to the test data. But in principle, we could have written this also as um, applying the kernel function kind of to the stack version of x1 and x2, where we just stack the data point from the training set to the training points from the test set, okay? So this is a gigantic multivariate distribution. So far, so simple. So what did we use here? We just use the definition of a GP. Okay, so f is a random function, and for a random function, basically f of x1 is also random, even if x1 and x2 are fixed, so they are assumed to be known, yeah, the outcome yeah, will be random, even if I don't have any noise, because the f is random, okay, and that's why they are Gaussian distributed. Great, so far so good. Now GP inference, like concrete, when you have a data set and you want to say something about your data, it would be then to say, now what is the conditional distribution of y2 given y1 and x1 and the new locations, okay? So that is GP inference in practice. So let's have a reminder, we learned something about this kind of setup in the lecture on Gaussians, right? So in the lecture on Gaussians, we had these joint distributions where I think I use slightly different letters in here, but in principle, it was a vector of x and a vector of y, for example. Here now it's a vector of y1 and a vector of y2, which can be stacked on top of each other. And then we noted that such a joint distribution has Gaussian marginals, right? Integrating out the other variable gives us a Gaussian distribution and we can read off the parameters here, but also Gaussian conditionals. And this is the thing we are interested in. In particular, we are interested in this formula down here. So we are interested in the probability of y2 given y1 and the other locations. And curiously, this looks very much like the formula we've seen last time already for the Gaussian process um, posterior kernel and mean functions. So let's apply this formula to the previous slide, okay? So this is the joint Gaussian. And if we plug everything in into the previous formula, yeah, then basically now we plug in here for the mu2, 
that the new mean is a linear combination of the mean mu2 plus something that we learned from the data y1, okay? And basically here, the relevant part is basically the stuff in y1 that is not explained by the mean. So the difference. And the weighting that we need to put in front of the mu2 is calculated basically from these kernel matrices or these covariance matrices, where in words they basically tell us, um, first of all, this is like an also normalization of the space. Let's forget about it first. But this thing is telling us how similar is the test data to the training data, right? If the, it's very similar, then these entries here on the off diagonal of the covariance matrix say, yes, they covary quite a bit. So if I know something about the X, the Y1s, I know also a lot about the Y2s. So they are covarying the values of the training and the test data. And how do we determine how they covary? By calculating basically some kernel function. So we can replace all these sigmas now with the other entries that we had before. And then basically we get exactly the same formulas as we seen last time. However, there are some details here to discuss. Um, so that's why I'm saying we are matching almost the posterior mean and covariance function. But let's, let me point out what the almost is. So the almost is this red part over here. So here's a plus sigma square, which is not over here. But as I said, the sigma was assumed to be zero, right? So we were considering the noise-free case. And so for the noise-free case, this term doesn't exist. Yeah, and the terms are really exactly one to one. So let's first understand. So what is this? This is a function of x. And for this x now, we can plug in the x2. And if we do that, then the right-hand side expression will be exactly this expression over here. Similarly, um, if we plug in x2 and x2 into this covariance function here, yeah, then this expression will be exactly that expression. Okay, so this is, I think, my new favorite view of GPs because it's so simple, right? Let me go back. What did we do? We started with the GPs in a nutshell that by collapsing onto finitely many locations, we have a Gaussian distribution. Okay, and then we said, Okay, let's take a finite training data set and a finite test data set, stack them on top of each other. Then we have a joint Gaussian distribution since we have a GP. Then just let's use our inference formulas for the conditional Gaussians, okay, and plug everything in and rewrite everything. And then we get basically already the formulas from which we can read off the posterior mean and covariance functions, okay? So far, so good. So I think this is really a very simple way to derive back like this result. In particular, I'm a bit struggling with these things because when you look in most of the books, typically assume they assume that the mean function is equal to zero and then certain terms, they don't appear here. However, being Bayesian now, I would like to have a setting where I might start with a zero mean function, but then I observe a couple of data points and these couple of data points now change my mean function. And then I observe further data points and they shouldn't take the zero mean function as a starting point, but the previous posterior mean function as a starting point. So if you really want to implement like a multi-step GP procedure where you first have one data point and then you have yet another data point and another one and another one, then you really need these formulas and they are quite hard to find, okay? So if you find a reference for this formula, please tell me I can put them then in the slides, but they kind of, I, I found it quite hard. So typically in the book, they trying to do it in a, uh, getting rid of the mean and just saying the mean is zero and we do it once anyway, so we don't care. Okay, so now let's talk about the noise. So what about the noise? So there's some subtlety here. Now, when you look at the books and they go to the noisy case, they sometimes say, okay, the joint distribution now looks like this. So I'm adding some noise here yeah, for the sigma one one, but I don't do it down here. And I also don't do it on the off diagonal term. Okay, the off diagonal term is easy to understand why we don't add the diagonal because basically the sigma squared i should only be added to the diagonal of the covariance matrix, right? Or with other words, the noise of 
the measurements of the training data is independent of the noise of the measurements of the test data. Yeah? And since they, the noise is assumed to be mean zero, it won't appear outside here on the off-diagonal terms. However, what about this one down here? So that's a bit more subtle. But let's first, let's postpone this. So let's first look at these equations now. So if I write down now with measurement noise in my training set, then I'm getting exactly the expressions that I would expect. So this sigma squared i is only appearing where there was a sigma 1, 1. And those are exactly the locations where we were also previously putting the plus sigma square i. Okay, so if I'm assuming measurement noise on the training set, but I don't care for noise in the test set, yeah, then those are exactly the equations. So, but still it's a bit um, puzzling that there's no sigma 2, 2 noise here, okay? So what about that one? So what if we put it in here as well? Then how, how would it change? It would change the first term here, the sigma 2, 2 will get an additional term over here, okay? And similarly, uh, okay, that's basically the kernel function down here. And that's all that changes. So the mean um, of this thing does not change, but only the variance will change by this sigma square i. Okay, so that's the only change here. Now, what is the interpretation of this? So somehow we were a bit sloppy with notation here, but I was it on purpose because I wanted to keep it as simple as possible. So here's y1 and y2, but y1 and y2, let's see how they were defined. So they were defined to be the function value plus some noise and the function value plus some noise. So it would have been more precise, not always to talk about the joint distribution of y1 and y2, but sometimes of y1 and sometimes of f of x2, right? If I want to be, if I'm interested in the Gaussian that explains me the uncertainty in the model, in the GP, right? Then basically I should have written an f of x2 down here. So let's do that. Let's write it out for the more general case. Um, then there are basically four situations. So I could have noise-free measurements, yeah? And I'm interested in the true functional value of my test data. Then actually I should have written up here, not y1 and y2, but f of x1 and f of x2. And in that case, I don't have to put the plus sigma over here. Then there's the second case, very important for practice. And that's a common case that you see mostly in the books. Um, you assume that your measurements were noisy. So you assume there's an additional variance here to go from f of x1 to y1. Yeah? So there's an additional noise. That's why we have the plus sigma over here. But then for the inference, I'm only interested yeah, in the functional values of my test set. And I'm only interested in the noise or the variability that I get due to my model choice, but not due to possible measurements. However, I could also write it like that. And then I would say, so I'm interested also in additional noise that I will get when I do a real measurement on the test set. So you measured um, a training set with some measurement noise. Um, you have locations for the test set. You do the Bayesian inference. And then if you then later on measure y, y2, yeah, then basically you will observe additional noise there, which is this one down here. And that is due to the measurement process, but it's not an uncertainty that is due to um, the thing being a Gaussian process. So that's why these things are distinguished. So typically people look at this, the middle case. So that's a common one. Yeah, so one needs to be careful to distinguish between those two variables here, um, those two sets of variables. However, if we assume that the, there's no noise, then we can omit it, okay? So then there's no distinction. Now, curiously, if you do it for y2, then we actually we are talking about the posterior predictive distribution, right? So the posterior predictive distribution integrates out the Gaussian process and ask for a new location, x2, what is the distribution of the y2 that I will observe when I do a measurement, when I do a noisy measurement, okay? And that's why there's an additional plus sigma squared. And actually, we had that also on our previous lecture, if we look very precisely back. So where are we here? So we were here at the 
posterior predictive mean and that was the story where we wanted to integrate out basically the um, uh, the Gaussian process and we are just interested in the posterior predictive distribution and let's see what we get out for that one. There we will get this plus sigma squared. So that is the additional noise that we get since we are um, not only interested in the value but we are interested in the variability of the value after the measurement and that's why we are adding here the sigma squared. Okay, let me jump forward. Let's see whether I can guess approximately. No, that's not enough. 40 something like this. Okay, so it's important to understand these three different cases and I must admit I learned about them in the morning when I was trying to make the slides and I was still puzzled. So why do they write a plus sigma over there but they don't put it down here. Yeah, and then I got it I think more clear that it's about distinguishing between the function value and the function value plus noise. Okay. And for the typical inference that we do with Gaussian processes, often we assume that we have measurement noise in our training data, but then for the inference, we don't care for this additional noise, okay? And so we omit it over there. Okay, so far so good. I, I hope you like this, this derivation also, since it's quite simple, right? You start with the GP, then you say finitely many, I have a joint distribution, a joint Gaussian distribution and then you use the formula from the conditional Gaussian and that's it, right? So that's the whole thing that you have to do. And um, I think that's also the reasoning in one of the blog posts. I think I point to it at the beginning of this chapter. So far so good. I was saying we will look at code today. So let's switch to code um, and I show you my implementation. Um, let me first tell you um, my implementation was not wrong, okay? but my parameter choice was not very good. So I needed to, to change a bit the parameters and then the code worked. However, I had to rewrite it for a couple of times since in Python or in NumPy, there's always a question, what is the vector, what is the matrix, okay? And so, so for you to fully appreciate this problem here, um, let's look at an example. So a vector in um, NumPy, for example, if you have this vector here, uh, one, two, three, yeah, then the shape typically is, it would be just three. So the tuple with three, okay? Sometimes people put a comma here for Python. If I have a vector like this, Then the shape would be three comma one. So this is what I typically call a column vector, right? Also here, x dot n dim is equal to two, and here x dot n dim is equal to one. So unfortunately, here we cannot distinguish between column and row vector, but here we can. Okay. So there's also the other version which looks like this, I think. Um, so how would I change it into a row vector? So it would be X transpose, okay? And now in this notation, it will be bracket open. And then I think I just have to put a list in here with double brackets, okay? And so here the shape will be 1.3, but the end name is still two, okay? So for a typical implementation involving linear algebra, often we take matrices and multiply them with vectors and all these things. And it gets really ugly if you mix this notation with that notation. Or sometimes if you multiply these vectors with matrices, then sometimes you get an object like that and sometimes you get something else and it transposes automatically and I found it a complete mess. So my implementation now, what it's doing, it's not using this case at all. It will always represent everything with n dim equals two. Okay, so that's basically, there's a whole data type for this. So in, in NumPy, there's the array, and then there's in NumPy also the matrix. I think it's mat, okay? And the mat is basically exactly the situation that I want. However, when you look at the web pages, the SciPy people and NumPy people say that the mat 
um, is deprecated sooner or later. So that's something one should use. So one should use the error array. However, I want to use it in such a way that the endim is always equals to two. And then everything is fine and the code is, code is less buggy. Okay, so let's look through the implementation. So, okay, I'm importing the usual stuff here. Um, and let's start with the first thing. So let's first define some mean functions. Okay, I hope the font is fine. I can increase it a little bit. Let's see, is it helping? Maybe it's better like this. So let's increase the font a little bit. Um, so I have the zero mean function. It's a function yeah, that takes any argument basically and it returns a zero of the same shape. So why do I do it at all? So why not just returning, why not just write it like in a, in a one-liner uh, like this zero mean fn is lambda a colon and then I want to have an np zeros a dot shape. So why not do it like that? Because I want to have at as many locations possible, I want to do this check whether I'm still having endim. So if there's one function that is kind of giving me a vector, I want to I want to track it down very quickly. So that's why I'm having this additional facility in here. So if I'm having an input which doesn't have endim equals two, then the thing will yell at me and it will stop. And ideally I'm close to the bug, okay? Similarly, I, have a, I can have a one mean function. So that's sometimes useful if you say, I want to have my data set and I calculate the mean of my values and I initialize the mean function with the mean of the values, for example. So that's maybe where you want to use the once mean function. But that's not such a super important thing. Okay, then there's some, some, some code fun in here. So, but let's get rid of that one. So that's older stuff. Then the second thing that we need to define are the kernel matrices, okay? And so let's write kernel functions. So those are then the covariance functions that we can use for our prior GP, okay? So let's start with the squared exponential kernel function. So it takes an A and a B, yeah, where the A and B again are assumed to be matrices, yeah? And in this case, um, we are assuming that the first dimension is the number of data point and the second dimension is the dimensionality. Yeah, that looks like that's the standard way of doing things here in Python. And that's the us uh, useful way to do it. And then of this A and B, we are calculating the square distances with some function that is fast. And then saying just e to the minus the square distances divided by some, some parameter, some kernel width. And we have another parameter, which is also multiplying this exponential. And we see later in some nice visualization what effect it has. Or maybe I show it, no, I, I don't show it to you now. I, I, let me first show you the implementation. Now, what about the hyperparameters? The, the, the hyperparameters, I want to deal with it as follows. Um, every kernel function gets like another parameter, the HP parameter, which are the hyperparameters, okay? And then I just extract from them like a variance and some length scale. Um, why am I put this, the square here? Later on, I want to do optimization over the parameter for the model selection. I want to automatically choose the hyperparameters. Yeah, and I, I want to have, for example, um, I, I don't want to care whether the HP of zero is positive or negative, but the variance always have to be a positive number. Okay, and so by this construction, it will always be. Now let's have a quick look on the squared distances. Again, I'm now a, a bit like here, um, a coward here and asking every question, uh, every function should ask this question whether I'm still fine. And the reason that I have it in here is because I had hours of fun dealing with these stupid dimensionalities in Python, okay? And that's why they are here now. So they are time savers. Okay, so basically I'm here dot multiplying the data matrix which itself and summing over the first axis and then comes the important parameter, keep dims equals true, okay? So what this keep dims equals true does, it avoids turning the whole thing into a vector. So if you just do an A star uh, A star A and sum up over the first axis, the output will no longer be an N by one matrix or vector, but it will be an N vector, okay? And that then will mess up all the following computations. So this is very important. Here I can do just, it looks like the outer product, but since we swapped 
um, since we have the data points along the rows, those are the inner products between all vectors in A and B. Yeah, and then this is like a clever way to calculate the square distances that we've seen already a couple of times. I need something similar for the minus and for some other kernel function. I want to take every row vector of A and calculate the difference to every other row vector. However, I'm only doing it for one dimensional data set. So um, it's restricted to this situation where I'm saying now the dimensionality of my locations is one dimensional. And that's like the most common case here in this um, code anyway. Okay, so far so good. Let's look at the linear kernel. So um, again, I have two hyperparameters which might come to a surprise to you, but let's look at the implementation. So basically I'm shifting my data with some constant number, yeah? And then I'm taking here the inner products, which look like outer products, but they are the inner products, as I said, because the data is in each row. And then I'm scaling the result up and also shifting it, okay? So these are now more general parameters than the ones that we are used to when we use these kernel functions for um, support vector machines. So here's another one, rational quadratic. So there's a whole chapter in Rasmussen and Williamson and uh, Williams, and there's a whole uh, web page, this cookbook from David Duvenot, where he's um, showing lots of different kernel functions. And here's yet another one. You take the square dif distances, but then you kind of take it to the power of minus alpha, okay, for whatever reason. So those are some other things. They are no Gaussian anymore, not to the power of two, but to the power of minus alpha and then one plus something. And for those, the proof that those are really positive definite function is much harder, of course. Here's another one, the periodic kernel. So that's also a fun one. So that's basically um, e to the minus something where we have sine in here and then looking at all the differences. And then there's another one, the Matern kernel. That's another weird one where we need some uh, weird uh, other functions from this special library of SciPy, okay? Some Bessel functions of certain types, some weird stuff. Okay, so now these different kernels, let's visualize them. And there's a really nice website, yeah, which is also linked in, in the slides and also in the, in the computation, which is showing us here, um, Let's see what we are seeing here. So we're having here the x-axis, and then here we are having a functional value, okay? And those are now functions that are sampled from a Gaussian process. Um, and this was a display I think I showed you last time, something like this, for example, where it now shows me if I have these observations, it kind of visualizes the distributions that we have. Okay, and the goal of the next 45 minutes is to get to something like that, to such an animation, right? A little bit less sophisticated, but in our Jupyter notebook, so that you really can understand every step how to generate this, okay? So, but why am I showing this to you? I wanted to show you now what's happening if I'm using different, um, uh, different kernel functions, but let's simplify the plot and let's switch off these, um, these animation. Then ignore for now all the other stuff here around. So the kernel function here is the squared exponential. Now what I want to show you is what's happening if I change the length scale down here in the kernel function. So for this, I have this nice slider and then you see what's happening, okay? So you see that if I change the length scale and make it very large, it basically means every data point is very lonely, right? Every, no, no data point is friends. Every data point is different from everyone else. So they can't learn from each other. So the solution here will be just the mean function, which is zero, almost everywhere, but only close to the data points. I'm going here and then I'm going away. So the kernel is also visualized up here. Yeah. So the kernel function got very narrow over here. So that's basically the effect of changing the length scale. If I make it very wide, then now everyone thinks they are neighbors with each other. And that means we are smoothing out everything in here, okay? Um, note that here, I think I'm assuming zero noise here. That's why the data goes really nicely through the data point. If I would allow a little bit of noise here, yet another hyperparameter, then you should see that I'm quickly ignoring the data, right? So if I say my measurement noise is really large, okay? So in this case, sigma is four, the standard deviation is four. Then it basically tells the GP, okay, better ignore the data. Don't look at the data, just use the knowledge from the prior. 
So if I reduce the noise, then you see how the data is used for getting a solution, okay? So let's look at the other parameter. So this is the, an interesting parameter here, the length scale. Now, what about the sigma square in front of the kernel function, right? Well, for the support vector machine, kind of it didn't matter because we had this coefficient alpha afterwards and the alpha was taking care of that, right? So if there's a certain kernel entry in your summation for the classifier that needs to be really large, you just set the alpha to a very large value. Um, however, here, now we have a parameter and we can see what's happening. And as you can see, basically what's changing here is the variance of the whole thing, okay? So that's what's going on. Um, okay, let's look at another kernel. Uh, we can look at this matern stuff. So the matern stuff, maybe right here, I don't know. Yeah, it has some other properties. Um, in particular, what you see here, um, this still looks like, um, like a balloon type of thing, but when you look here, the derivative of this point yeah, at this point, it's not derivable anymore. So there's really a peak and then it goes down again. But that's what sometimes happens in data, right? Suppose this is like the, 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 the exchange rate for the euro or something. Yeah, then at some point there's an event and then the whole thing drops and it's not going nice and smoothly. So the squared exponential kernel, yeah, that one tries to make like a nice smooth curve everywhere that is everywhere differentiable. However, the Matern kernel, yeah, it's also able to do to do something sharper, okay? So depends on your data, what you want to use. Um, then there's another fun one, the, okay, the linear one you know, right? So that's just a straight line, okay? So let's see what the parameters are doing. Um, the parameters here are doing almost nothing, interesting, but the bias is doing something, okay, interesting. Yeah, but I'm, the, I find that one a bit confusing with all these parameters. Let's look at the periodic one. Okay, curious. So the periodic kernel leads to periodic functions. Yeah, in particular, that means that this point over here is not only giving us information right here in its neighborhood, but it's also giving us information over there. And it's giving us information over there. So the periodic kernel is interesting for data sets where you know there are some periodicity happening. For example, the CO2 data set from these Hawaiian, Mauna, Laua, Lua thing. So there basically we know that all the generaries, they are correlated with each other, right? So if I observe one generary over, over here, then the generary in one year will have a similar temperature and so will be the next generary and so on. So that's where the periodicity kind of makes sense. So also here we can change the length scale where here the length scale is a bit weird to me, but there's also the period periodicity. So that's the one that is kind of simpler. Is it simpler? It's also weird. Okay, let's first look at this length scale thing. And okay, the variance is a simple one. So that is just increasing the variance of the whole thing. But the length scale I find again a bit confusing. Oh yeah, that's the one where basically uh, whether you look only at a certain location or whether you're lo looking in a wider area. Maybe um, this up here is showing us the kernel function at a certain location, okay? This is going up and down, ignore the yellow stuff, only look at the red line. And the red line is basically telling us how for a certain point, the other points are similar. And as you see, the points right here around X1, they are very similar to each other. And then when you have reached the period where you're in the same month, basically, you're also very similar. However, that is going negative, that's a bit weird in my opinion. Good, so that's the periodic kernel. Let's flip back to our code before we continue with that one. So now you see that these different kernels, they have different properties, like the periodic kernel might be good to model something that has some periodicity in here. The matern kernel is good for modeling something that has some abrupt changes. Um, not today, but next, next time, next week on Monday, we will look at these Mauna Lua data and look at these kernel choices that they did there and try to understand. Um, how they did it. Okay, so far so good. So those are the kernel functions. So here I have some, some test data that kind of is running some stuff, but that is not relevant to us right now. Um, maybe one thing, you can always visualize the squared exponential kernel very easily. So suppose 
um, you are having um, a lin space from zero to 10. So the data set is basically a long vector of real numbers from zero to 10. So those are your locations. And I'm doing here the reshape because of my endim obsession here that everything should be two dimensional. And then I can calculate the squared exponential kernel for this data set with certain parameters and I can look at it, okay? So maybe I, I need to make the, this old thing smaller so that we can get it on the screen. And then what you're seeing here is, ah, that's too small. Okay, maybe that's good. Um, that along the diagonal points are very similar to each other and they are similar to its, to its neighbors but not so similar to far away points. So here we get small numbers. So this is like zero something, and this is like close to one. And this is because the data set is sorted, right? It's sorted from zero to 10. And that's why we're getting this shape. In particular now, when we change here a parameter, for example, that one, then we will see, um, well, in this case, we didn't see, oh yeah, in this, the first parameter is changing um, the outer scaling. So before we had a one over here in the legend, and now we have a four. Okay, so basically the thing went up, but the image didn't change. If I change this number here, the whole thing should get wider. Okay, now my thing got wider, my Gaussian is wider and I'm friend with more among me. Okay, so this is good to, for visualization. Okay, let's get the data. And so here's some data that I load from some CSV file. So it looks like this, I'm having these three points, the one that I just also put into the website. Okay, those are my three points. And um, again, I need to ensure that they have the right shape. So that's the annoying thing. Yeah, I tried all variants. I use vectors and then at some point the code wasn't working and I had bugs and so on and so forth. And that was the one that I could get to work where ndim is equal to two. The other thing I'm doing here in this data set thing, I'm setting a prior mean function and I'm setting a prior covariance function. And here I'm just taking the squared exponential. I also set some hyperparameters here. And last time I think we had here a 1.0 and that was the overall scaling of the Gaussian. And it was just too small to fit the data which has like plus 14 as a value. So I needed to put something larger in here. Okay, so that is this data set. There's a more complete one, which I show you an image of. So that is a more complete data set. You see much more structure, also some periodicity going up and down. And then of course, later on, we will see next time, maybe we see that we can try to model it with a combination of kernels, right? So we have a kernel, a linear kernel, which should capture the linear trend. Yeah, so the parameters of the linear kernel will tell me the slope maybe with which it is rising. And then there's a periodic kernel for this up and down movement there. Okay, and then there's a squared exponential kernel for the garbage, yeah? for the noisy or so the weird stuff that's happening there. So you could think of these three kernel functions as there's a straight line and you add to that some sinusoid, so it's going upwards. And then there's also some wiggliness that explains the rest. So that's how these things are designed. But we will look at it next time. Um, notice from the implementation now, our vector of hyperparameters got really long. Yeah, and we kind of cleverly chopping out the pieces for the different kernels, okay? So that's very useful. Luckily, we have to do it only once here, and then it's all contained in this prior covariance function. So the prior covariance function knows how to read out the hyperparameters for the different kernels. So that's like very clever. I think I copied it from elsewhere. So here's another data set that's the exchange rate between Euro and the British pound. And that's an example where you have these spiky data, right? Where you kind of don't want to smooth out all these spikes, but you want to follow the data, but you might should use a Matern kernel or something like that. And okay, here we use a rational quadratic kernel. We can also plug in a, a Matern kernel, but not now. Then there's here the Mauna Loa data set. So that is the one that's going always up and down and up and down. And here, of course, if you would just do regression, a linear regression, you would get a straight line. And that is telling us a general trend. However, um, this example is from the book of Rasmussen and Williams. They use a quite sophisticated design of the kernel, where the kernel is not falling from the sky, but they have a very good interpretation for each of these kernel functions. So one should cap capture the periodicity, one should do this, one should do that. And that's kind of like now getting more sophisticated. So here, people are really trying to 
write down a model where they put their physical knowledge into use and then they estimate the parameters, the hyperparameters to learn something about the data. So they not only want to um, extrapolate or interpolate or do that, but they want to learn parameters of the data. Good, but we look at the simple data set and that is this one over here. We only take three data points and it's also much faster. Okay, so last time I showed you already that there's this collections dot name tuple features in Python 3.9 or 3.10. I forgot which version they added it in or maybe even earlier um, that we can now elegantly kind of have like a struct with two entries where we have two named entries and this is an immutable data structure. So I cannot assign anything to the slots. They are assigned when I construct them and then they are fixed. Okay, so let's do that. I take the one that were given then we have these nice formulas, which I like a lot, like this functional perspective on GPs, which is now here, hopefully bug free implemented with the update GP function. Let's go through it. So first of all, we need to, we, we want to implement this formula down here. We want to define a posterior mean function now where we basically have implemented the formula that is written up here. So where is it? So it's over there. So this formula M of A plus kernel, blah, blah, blah. So that should be this code. Let's see how we did it. So first of all, we need to take the M zero of A, which is like the prior mean function. Yeah. And apply it to A where A is here, the parameter of my new function. Okay. So far so good. So the G will be the prior GP. We will hand it over to the update GP or it is a posterior GP from some previous data. Yeah, so it could be anything. Um, and then we add to it like this kernel where we only have one input here. So for the first input, we plug in the data set. And then this thing is defining us a vector valued function, right? For every scalar input or for every single data point, we would get here. Um, in this case, uh, a vector. Um, then we have a matrix which we need to invert. And finally, we have the difference between the observations of my training set minus the one that we would expect from the mean function, which is most often zero. So um, the thing that you see often for GPs is just this formula over here because the mean function is assumed to be zero. But when you want to include it, you need to do it like that. Okay, so let's see how we implement it now here. So for the kx, we also define a function. Okay, so the kx is also a lambda x where we use the kernel function with the current hyperparameters. And those are where the difficulties come if you don't have this endim equals to two, because sometimes the gk gives you a vector, sometimes it gives you a matrix or the x is sometimes just a single number or it could be a whole data set of numbers, right? Then the whole thing should be a matrix that you get out of it, right? Then you would have the sigma one, two of diagonal matrix, for example. And all this mess is gone if you assume endim equals two. So this is my tip. If you are struggling with this vector stuff and you also don't like it, use endim equals two. Okay, so this function kx can be plugged in down here. Now, what about the alpha? So the alpha is a vector and it's calculated by this formula over there. So let's see. So first of all, the matrix that needs to be inverted, it is the matrix Z. It is the kernel matrix, so the KXX, which just is calculated from my prior covariance function plus sigma squared and identity matrix. Of course, here you have to be careful that you don't omit the NPI because if you would do it like that, then you would add the sigma two to every element of the kernel matrix. However, you only want to add it to the diagonal. So you really have to multiply it with the identity matrix. Um, next, I call the inversion. Okay, I don't need the inversion really for the alpha term, but I need it later down here. So let's forget about it now. Now the alpha then is this so using the solver where I'm avoiding the inversion of the Z and I'm um, applying it to the difference. So now why I, am I not using my Z inf here, right? So I could have written it also Z inf at, and then Y minus MX. So the experts say 
that this is a more stable way to do it. Okay, so this is a more stable way to multiply this vector with the inverse of this matrix. Okay, now you're asking, so what, then why are you generating it at all? So why is it there? The reason being, we need it later for the covariance function. So for the posterior covariance function, we really actually need it. And we, there's no shortcut to avoid it here. Okay, good. So, um, I mean, okay, we could have put in here, down here, the, okay, that would have been another thing. Okay, let's do that, but I won't keep it. So since the other one is better, so we could have implemented now the covariance matrix, uh, the covariance function like this. Ah, this is also so stupid. How do I get a, a bracket close here? Okay, now I have it. Um, so we could have implemented it like that. However, this posterior covariance function will be called very, very often. Yeah, so I will call very often this lin alk solve function. And since I'm having lots of kx of b, it's cheaper to calculate the inverse once and for all. And then I'm just having here matrix vector a vector, yeah, matrix vector multiplication. So if I would call the posterior covariance function only once, that would be the implementation. However, I'm calling it very often, then it's better to pre-calculate um, this matrix and just connect them like that, okay? So that is the idea of um, the implementation here. Any questions, by the way, along the way? Or is it all clear? Do you mind this level of detail or should I go faster over it? Or do you, is it insightful for you? You can also put it into the chat. Okay, there's a thumb up, okay. And no thumb down. Okay, so then let's let's continue with this rhythm. It took me quite a while to get it down like that. Maybe that's why I like to talk about it so long. But I think there are many pitfalls when you implement it yourself. Good. Okay, so this is basically now the implementation of the whole thing. And um, so let's apply it. So let's apply to our prior GP. So that's it. So that was the inference, right? So what happened now in this update GP? How expensive was it? Okay, I had to invert one matrix. That was probably O to the N3 or something. And I need to solve one of those. So I need to call one solve. So it's not super cheap, right? So the GP inference is expensive and the expensive step is that one, the inversion in this case. Okay. So if you want to be faster and you say, I'm using the update anyway, only once, yeah, then you are better to do everything with lin alk solve. So if you just have data and you do the inference only once, you use the lin alk solve. If you want to have the general solution, starting with the GP and getting a posterior GP and getting another posterior GP, then you have to do it like this. Good, so far so good. Let's visualize our solution, okay? For visualization, we do the following. First of all, we do a scatter plot of, um, okay, I show you already the image. So we want to have this kind of image. We have the three data points here. Then we want to have the estimate of the mean function. So this is basically visualizing the mean function. And we want to visualize for each data point the variance, okay? So let's see how it goes. So um, first of all, this is a scatter plot. This is plotting here these data points. And then we have a special function which is plotting all the other stuff and extracting it from the GP. So let's have a look at that function. So that function is taking like a range. So the X is now not the data set, but the X is the lint space from the left-hand bound to the right-hand bound of the plot. Yeah, so it's basically an X range which we define ourselves. Um, for this new range, we need to evaluate the mean function to get the y, and we need to evaluate the um, kernel function. This is a bit wasteful because actually we are only interested in the diagonal, but that was easier to implement and less buggy than my other options that I use. Then I extract the diagonal of the thing and take the square root to get the standard deviation. And um, again, I need to reshape. Since I'm obsessed with this reshaping, so now I reshape it again to matrices. And then for the plotting, I can plot the mean, which is down here, which is taking the y, and I can plot the y plus standard deviation, the y minus standard deviation. 
So those two areas are giving me the 65 percent percentile. So that is like the, the mean plus one standard deviation plus minus one standard deviation. And I'm also showing you one with two standard deviation. And that is like, a, I think, a 95 percent confidence interval or something. Okay, and that's it. Um, I tell you something about the other plot in a second. So that's how you get this plot basically, right? And um, it's nicely showing us now something about this uh, solution. You might wonder what is this guy over here? So what did I plot over here? So that is the GP prior, okay? So this is just plotting the prior GP. The prior GP has zero mean function, okay? And the covariance, matrix so the kernel matrix along the diagonal is constant okay that's why we have everywhere the same thing so here i haven't seen any data okay then those are the functions this is the distribution of the functions of course that's nice but we can do better at the end we want to have something fancy like uh where is it we want to get to this weird animation okay so how do we get there so for this um let's first learn how to sample from a gaussian process okay so to sample now from a gaussian process first of all what does it mean to sample from a gaussian process it means um you are given uh, a mean function a covariance function and you want to randomly sample one function f right run random sample from this gp okay and of course again that's a weird thing to to do because how can we sample a function, right? In computers, we can only sample finite stuff, right? We cannot really sample an infinite object or something. Okay, again, we are using the important property number one of a GP. If you look at finite location, the data will be Gaussian distributed, okay? So what, in order to sample from a GP, we are not actually sampling a function, but we are sampling finitely many function values along the x-axis. So we are sampling, for example, 100 values from the x-axis, and then we plot a line through all those values. So that's how you sample from a GP. So for this, first of all, we need to sample from a Gaussian distribution. And you might say, yeah, this is simple, right? You just do um, the rand n. However, I mean, we want to do it for a particular mean and a particular covariance. And I think I've showed you already how to do it, but let me show you again because this is really important to understand. I'm also aware that there are functions, right? So I'm always trying to implement everything with these stupid standard normal distributed rand n, right? And I know in Python there are libraries for this so that you can sample from a Gaussian distribution with a certain mean vector and a covariance matrix. But I want you to understand it how this is done, okay? So it is done as follows. I need to take the Koleski decomposition of the sigma and then I'm transforming the standard normal sample by multiplying it with this L and adding it, adding the mean vector. Now you might wonder, so what is this Koleski decomposition thing all about? Okay, so I will show you. So for this, I need some code and I need some additional code. So uh, let's say I'm having a random sigma. Okay, so let's say I'm taking uh, let's say a five dimensional random sigma that is just a random matrix i need to ensure that it's positive definite i can ensure that by multiplying it with itself transposed okay okay now it's positive definite and now it should be a reasonable covariance matrix okay oh now it's it's very bad so it's not okay so this is again heritage of MATLAB. So now I got a symmetric matrix, which ideally has positive eigenvalues. So I guess there must be a function for this lin alg eig of sigma. Does it work right away? Yes. And as you can see, all eigenvalues are positive. Okay, so that's good. So now, typically what we do when we scale standard normal things we multiply with the standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, right? So we need to multiply by sigma. I made the mistake on the previous slides that I showed you before, but it must be multiplied by sigma because then when we want to calculate the variance, we are kind of square squaring the output, right? And when we square the output, the standard deviation goes back to be a variance. So similarly here, we need to multiply with the square root of the covariance matrix. And that's 
is something where you know already positive number don't only have one square root, but the square root of 25 is five, but also minus five, okay? So in the matrix world, square roots are exploding. So there are many, many possible square roots for a matrix. So now what do I mean by a square root of a matrix? I think I told you already, but for um, it's very, very quick. So let me repeat it. So a square root of a matrix basically is a matrix. If you multiply it with itself, transpose, it should be that matrix. Okay, so that is the square root. And now the Cholesky decomposition is giving you just one of these. Okay, so the Cholesky decomposition is giving you for a positive definite matrix, it's giving you a square root. And it's a particular efficient method to do so. Good. Of course, when you implement something like this, yeah, you shouldn't now just say, okay, L is NP lin alk Cholesky of sigma, and then you multiply it with the random thing. You need to check that you're doing the right thing, right? So let's check whether we are doing the right thing. So let's output the sigma, print sigma, and let's output the L dot transpose. And they should be the same. Okay, I already did a too big example here. So let's take a three by three matrix. Okay, and they are exactly the same. They don't have to be like that. It could have been the other way around, right? It, it could have been the other way around, but that would have been the wrong, wrong case. So you need to be sure that you know what your library gives you. And um, guess what? Some libraries, some, some Cholesky libraries give you an R, the letter R, okay? Where the R is not the lower triangular matrix, but an upper, right upper triangular matrix. And so it might have different properties. So it's always important to check that. Then the next thing that you need to check is if, let's say I'm doing it like that now that I'm saying L at, and then I'm saying NP random, rand n three by one or three by a hundred or thousand. So I'm looking for 1000 three dimensional vectors, which are now turned into a certain covariant shape. And the question is, do I have to do it with L or with L transpose, okay? This is something that you need to check. And the way to check it is to calculate the covariance matrix. And surprise, I'm getting a name error. Okay, it's not existing. NP dot, maybe like this. So if I calculate now the sample covariance matrix of my sample data, I get a matrix which is exactly my sigma, okay? So when you implement code, always check both cases. And in this case, you get something wrong, okay? So, so this is the right implementation. So this implementation is fine. Okay, now that was a long, long talk about a random Gaussian distribution. Now, what do we plug in for the mean and for the variance? What we plug in is we calculate for locations along the x axis, we calculate the mean function and we plug this vector in. Okay, so if we have 100 locations, we are talking here about little d being 100 and we plug in the kernel matrix here for the covariant thing. And then we can just sample from a Gaussian distribution and that gives us a sample from a GP. So I'm calculating a mean by evaluating the mean function and I'm calculating a sigma by evaluating the kernel function. In this case, plus some noise because here I need this for the Cholesky to be happy. Yeah, otherwise it's yelling at me. So it doesn't like very small values. The problem in very high dimensions, if you have a random vector in very high dimensions, um, often here the, the covariance matrix will have very small entries due to numerical reasons, even that they are positive. And I just need to get rid of these numerical problems here. So this is my GP sample function now. And um, how do I plot them? Okay, I can draw n samples. Yeah. And I just plot all of those into my nice existing plot. So let's do that. And um, here are my samples for my GP. So let's see what GP did I use. In this case, I used the prior GP, okay? So those are all samples now from my prior GP and I can repeat it and I'm getting more and more samples. So those are random samples from my GP if I haven't seen any data, okay? Now, if I've seen some data, then the picture looks different. 
And then I'm still, I'm again having, in this case, these three data points here, interesting where they are. And I can draw samples from them. Okay. Good, so far so good. Um, how do we get from this to these cool animations? Is it just drawing samples and just drawing them? That wouldn't look very nice. What you want to have, you want to have smoothly changing things over here, okay? So where do we get this smoothly changing stuff? So that is explained in Philip Hennig's paper. Uh, it's a tech report. And um, here now we take his idea, but we implement it differently, okay? And for this, let me tell you, so how could we draw nicely, smoothly varying samples from a Gaussian distribution, right? Because drawing samples from a GP is nothing else than drawing samples from a very high dimensional Gaussian distribution. So suppose this is my Gaussian distribution, right? So what would be nice random samples here? Nice smoothly varying random samples would be to draw for example, one point, and then to follow the shape of the ellipse and always going round and round and round, okay? Always going round the Gaussian distribution at this distance. If my first data point is over here, it would go round like this. However, it's not going like a circular round, it's going around that is following the shape of the ellipse. Now, what are these axes in here in our GP example, it will be f of x1 and f of x2. And those are two points which are kind of correlated with each other, right? So actually we are here in a very high dimensional space, let's say a hundred dimensional Gaussian distribution with a certain covariance matrix, which is exactly the kernel matrix. And from that one we want to sample basically like circles that go around the center. Okay, so that's it. Of course, Already in three dimensions, we have many possibility, right? When you think of a soccer ball, you have as a center and you have like a point on the soccer ball, you could go around like that, but you could also go around like that. So we also randomly need to choose some orthogonal vector to the one that we have. And that is the approach in the paper that you randomly sample one point and then an orthogonal vector to that one. So you need to orthogonalize some other random sample. And then you use some matrix exponential some exponential map from differential geometry or something, which I wasn't able to understand. And so here's a simpler version, which just takes this circle idea. So let's first learn how to sample a circle around, uh, like a, how to get the points around a circle. So let's do it step by step. Um, okay, so here we go. First of all, we start with sampling a random ellipse. So that is our first goal, okay? And what I mean by that is, um, let's go step by step. First of all, here's a function that calculates 2D coordinates that are the unit circle, okay? So this is just the co 2D coordinates that go around the unit circle, okay? So it's really just generating the space from zero to two pi, okay? From zero to two pi. I want to have n steps around the unit circle, and then I plug it into the cosine and the sine function. Okay, and the result will be a two by n matrix. In this case, every column is a point in the 2D plane and I'm going in circles. Now I'm taking this circle that is on a piece of paper and I rotate it into 3D, okay? And by this, I'm having a random circle on the sphere, or I can rotate it into a hundred dimensions. Then I have a random circle in 100D. So how do I how do I project a two-dimensional space into a hundred dimensions? I need to randomly sample two orthogonal vectors in a hundred dimensions and then project the data onto it, okay? Which is just a matrix vector multiplication. So let's first generate a random rotation matrix. How do we get that one? So here's another trick. You just generate a random matrix and you look at the SVD and you know the SVD of these matrices, they give you like these orthonormal systems. And we just take the orthonormal system that is mapping the two dimensional space into the higher dimensional space. And since we're starting with something completely random here, we will get two very random directions into the high dimensional space. So now in order to get a random circle that is in higher dimensions in D dimensions, we just multiply our unit circle with our random rotation matrix. 
Okay, so far so good. We are still on the unit sphere in high dimensions. Let's multiply it with some random radius, okay? But the radius should follow the Gaussian distribution that we have. So what we're doing here, we just take a random d-dimensional vector and just calculating the distance to the origin to have like a properly sampled radius for a Gaussian distribution, okay? And that is multiplied now with this stuff over here. So this is giving us a random circle. Great, we are almost there. Next, we are still, we are using the same trick with the mu and the sigma to get a random ellipse. And so for the random ellipse, again, we're doing a Cholesky decomposition of the covariance matrix and we just multiply our random circle and shifting it by mu. So now this is a function that is generating us for a given mean vector and a given covariance matrix, a random ellipse, which is going around it, okay? So the nice thing here is we don't care at the beginning for the mu and the sigma, we first start with a 2D circle, map it into higher dimensions, and then we transform it with our covariance matrix to get the things that we want. And that's it. So now, as you know, every point in this 100 dimensional data space is like one possible function, but now we have a nice ellipse in this space. And by this, we are getting like a nicely smoothly varying function, okay? So all the steps are written here. Um, now it comes some, again, some plotly mumbo jumbo. So it looks like any, any plotting library, it doesn't matter whether it's matplotlib or whether it's plotly. When you want to do animation, kind of, the documentation is very, very sparse. And you basically need to interpolate what you want to do from examples, which is super hard. Um, so this is not ideal yet, but it looks okay, okay? So here's some stuff that I copied from elsewhere, um, some, from some tutorials. Basically what you do is in the plotly thing, you have some, some options that you can add the frames um, entry in the dictionary and you can list lots of frames in this dictionary that then get played after each other. Okay, so basically what the key point here is, I need to calculate the mean for my x2 is now the locations along the x-axis and I need to calculate the covariance matrix for the points along the x-axis and then I'm generating random ellipses for this mean and this covariance. But I'm calling this function n times if I want to have n wiggly functions at the same time. And then I need to put these all y's, all these samples, I need to put them cleverly into the data structure of my plot list stuff. Okay, so let's do that. And hopefully the whole thing works. So let's first try it for the prior distribution. So when you do it now, it needs to do some calculation. So it looks like my, my old machine here is already struggling a little bit with that because it's streaming at the same time. So where is it? It's still running. So, okay, let's be a bit patient. Oh, it should be there already and it's not. So that's very bad. Oh, it's over here. Oh, I scrolled at the right, wrong location. Okay, I can put the play button and now you see what's going on and you see these nice, nice things. So basically each of these lines is a single point on the ellipse. And when you go around the ellipse, the thing is nicely smoothly varying. So why are those so nicely smoothly things? Because that's what the kernel matrix is telling us. The kernel matrix is telling us if for the point zero, I'm here at 21 or something, it means that the close by points, they also need to be around 21 because they are super correlated. However, this point is not very much correlated with points at minus five. That's why there something completely different can happen. Okay, let's do the same thing now for the posterior. And for the posterior, I get an error message. Great. So can I solve it? Uh, no, but this is, this is a bit bad now. Okay, let me give it one try, whether I can repair it by reloading the data. And if not, then we are just unlucky. Okay, let me reload the data and then we do it again. I try to make it robust. Okay, so that's it. So that's loading the data. Let's go down again to the animation, to the cool animation. Um, so there's an error message. Weird. Plot GP animation, so that one. And it looks like it worked. Okay, very good. No, it didn't. It's still running. 
Oh, there, there we go, it's coming. Okay, so it worked, nice. And I can hit the play button. And then now it shows you the animation. So what you note here is that at this location, there's almost no variance because we observed the data point, right? So all functions are going through this point. All functions are going to this point and in between there's not so much possibility here, right? But here we have quite a bit of variability, okay? So that is um, basically the thing how to visualize this stuff. And maybe now after seeing that one, uh, you can appreciate this really nice code from uh, these people over here where they, um, uh, let me change the link scale. Yeah, where they put everything into JavaScript. Maybe before we stop for today, um, let me just show you. So up here, basically these numbers, yeah, they correspond to the entries in the covariance matrix. Okay, so that one is a red value. Um, I th uh, okay, I'm a bit confused by it because some of the values can also be negative. But so basically I think this point here corresponds now to the 0, 6, 3. So I can't, sh so the 0, 8, 3. So that is that point over here. And so you see how the covariance matrix is changing and how these two points are correlated or not. So if they're far away, they're not correlated. If they're close by, they are correlated. And this correlation can be also nicely seen in this plot, where for these two locations that I show you here, yeah, you see basically a slice through this 100 dimensional space. And so if I'm getting very close, the Gaussian at the bottom right corner um, gets um, like very concentrated. And when I'm moving far further away, the Gaussian gets larger and larger, okay? So the plot here on this side is ba basically telling us a two-dimensional slice, the one that I drawn here of this 100-dimensional space where the Gaussian is. And you see also how the curves are going around. However, they are using here different techniques. So they either use the interpolated random sampling thing Oh, they can also use great circles. So I guess that is then the implementation that we choose, okay? And you might notice that this is going on ellipses here. That is because here we are in a projection. I think that's the reason. Otherwise it's kind of weird, but maybe they also use some other, some other tricks here. So maybe one should look at the open source code. Um, of course we could increase the number and making it more fancy. It's quite performant, so I'm really surprised how well it works. And it's good for playing around and to get like an idea what these different parameters mean, okay? Good, so far so good. Um, let's see, what are we doing next time? So that was the implementation stuff. So next time we want to find the hyperparameters. So we want to do model selection. So, so far the hyperparameters like the length scale, they all fall from the sky and Typically now you would say, okay, we get them by cross-validation, right? So you take the training set, you split it into test uh, training and validation, and then you fiddle around with it on the validation set. And here we are now Bayesian and we're doing Bayesian parameter selection. And in the Bayesian model selection, we can use all the training data to find the hyperparameters and doing something else. And basically it's the same stuff that I explained to you already. Um, Previously, when we talked about model selection for regression, I forgot which lecture it was, but it was a lecture in last year sometime, okay? And next time we go through the relevant details of that lecture again, and I will show you how to do it now then for the GPs. And ideally, also my computer is fast enough to show you some examples that it works. And ideally, we can look at the Mauna, Kua data and see um, the reasoning between the different for the different choices why having such a complicated kernel is a good idea. Great, so for today, I thank you for your attention and I see you then next week on Monday. Bye-bye.